Sometimes a video game comes along and shatters the mold so egregiously and elegantly that it turns the entire process of game creation on its head. With breathtaking visuals, enchanting melodies, enthralling story, memorable characters, endless secrets, and pacifying gameplay, it seemingly takes the throne as the greatest game of all time. And then you find out Nintendo made two of these damn things in two years back to back. What the fuck? Hi everybody, I'm Jake from Good Game Gaming and today I finally, finally get to The Legend of Zelda titles Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask. These two games consistently over the past two and a half decades have ranked up on the greatest games of all time lists over and over and over and over again. And last year Nintendo launched the uh, Nintendo Online Plus membership, I think that's what it's called, don't quote me, where instead of paying, what, 17 to 20 bucks a year, you pay 80 bucks a year, and you get tons of old school emulators, the Nintendo, Super Nintendo, N64 now, the Sega Genesis even, it's pretty rad. So naturally when they launched this program, they had Ocarina of Time as its front runner. Kind of. And then a few months later, I think it was in February or in March of 2022, they launched Majora's Mask. So I've been playing the crap out of them. Poorly described, this is a story about a 10-year-old kid who obtains a godlike power known as the Triforce of Courage and two magical items that control the flow of time, the Master Sword and the Ocarina of Time. And in utilizing these things, unleashes a terror upon his world literally raising his entire countryside in fire um, and also created uh, the demon king Ganon and these these two stories are basically him trying to right that wrong and then live out the rest of his life with that mistake he's 10 he's 10 years old and he watches everyone that he cares about suffer and or die it's kind of it's kind of deep true Zelda fans tend to forget that young link is 10 years old like he's not even he's not even like a, a person yet. Like can you think of a ten year old? Are they a good person? No, they're ten. Yeah, that's a that, nope, not yet. <laughs> so I'm gonna start with Ocarina of Time, uh, mainly because it's chronologically the first. Uh, but Majora's Mask takes almost everything from Ocarina of Time, tweaks it a little bit, makes it a little bit better, tightens it up a little bit. Uh, but Ocarina of Time was the groundwork for both of these games. In 1998, the world would be graced with what could only be called a video game masterpiece. The Legend of Zelda, Ocarina of Time. Initially, it was planned for the Nintendo 64 add-on, the 64DD. That fell through. Right, it was gonna be this new add-on that could add a compact disc function on the bottom of the Nintendo 64. Nintendo basically scrapped that idea for America, scrambled to get this Zelda game they've been working on to fit onto a cartridge. We tend to forget that in 1998, CDs, compact discs, were not like all the rage yet, you know? Uh, you still had the cassette tape era from the 80s carrying over and then compact discs were pretty expensive and you know, you didn't quite have the technology to just burn CDs and make CDs or play CDs and all the things it took to play a CD cost a lot of extra money. Just a CD player, like a Walkman, was like 50 bucks in the 90s and that, well, that's a good chunk of change now. Um, adjusting for inflation in 2022, I think like a $50 Walkman CD player uh, back in the 90s is probably about uh, $437,000 now. You know, most people in 1998 still had like a 128 megabyte hard drive on their Hewlett Packard. Those are rough times. Dial up was also not great. That was not a, a wonderful thing. God, the 90s were weird. Eventually, Nintendo just abandoned the CD idea. They got, they got completely away from the 64DD. They, they didn't work. They were like, okay, let's make a cartridge. And in no way am I exaggerating this or understating this, but what they released on the cartridge after they fixed all the developmental problems was quite possibly one of the greatest feats in video game history. The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time was the most elegant, and masterfully made game up until that point in 1998. Bar none. It was such, it was just, it was a masterpiece, man. 
It was, it had so many things going for it. Ah, I could gush. But just hear me out when I say, as an eight year old in 1998, when that game got into my hands, I didn't want to do anything except play it. It was that good. It took all of my attention away from Super Mario 64, Turok the Dinosaur Hunter, Mischief Makers, I think, was out there around that time too. Stomped all of them. Stomped them. It was so much better than anything that had come out until that point. If the graphical capabilities weren't enough to get you enthralled in Ocarina of Time, the music was hands down some of the best ever composed. It, it's still popular today. Like you could just go do Song of Storms dubstep and like people are still using these themes, these melodies and making awesome, awesome stuff out of it. The bosses, totally unique. I mean, they really didn't have anything to go on. They were transforming from, you know, a link to the past in 2D to Ocarina of Time in 3D. They had to basically scrap every idea they had and they remade all of these bosses from the ground up, from scratch, original ideas. In fact, a lot of like the original artwork that you see in the instruction booklet, is it's just beautiful. It, they look like hand-painted murals of these bosses and characters. I, I distinctly remember always loving how the Kokiri kids in the, the manual looked. They, it looked like there was a lot of time and love put into making these characters. We're gonna get into this a tiny bit later. But one of, if not the most important feature of the gameplay that revolutionized the gaming industry was in fact, Z-targeting. <laughs> Give me a minute, we're gonna get there, I promise. Even after all of that, they went one step further. The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time had one of the biggest, most elaborate maps of any game ever. Hyrule Field was this vast, open, lush area. There was a farm in the middle. There were like random secrets hidden all throughout near these trees, near bushes, near walls, near signs. It was, it, there's still people finding crap out about it right now. I watched a video the other day about this cave in the secret forest meadow that just has like weird lines going up and down and no one can figure out why they added it or what's going on there. And it's 24 years old at this point. It's, it's, I, it's just breathtaking that they made such a cool thing so long ago. Hey, you know how we have this game that sounds beautiful, looks beautiful, with really fun combat and tons of items? How about we also make it the biggest game to date on a console? Cool? Cool. God, they just, I don't know what that boardroom meeting was like over Nintendo in Japan, but someone had to be like, hey, you guys wanna just make the best thing ever? Yeah, 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 Kojima? Yeah, like, come on. Masahiro Sakura, you want in on this? No, 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 you got your own thing with, can, well, can our guy be in your game? Cool, cool, it's gonna be good. He's got a sword and a shield yeah, and a hook shot. Boom. It's like Scorpion from Mortal Kombat. <laughs> One in a deep forest. One on a high mountain. One under a vast lake. One within the house of the dead. One inside a goddess of the sand. Together with the hero of time, the awakened ones will bind the evil and return the light of peace to the world. The story in Ocarina of Time is so good that almost every other game in the series references it in some way, in some fashion. Even the games they made prior to Ocarina of Time had like loop, little open ended things that they never solved. And then Ocarina of Time came in and they patched up all the previous open ended questions of all the previous games. You had three before it. You had, yeah, you know, Legend of Zelda, Link's uh, Adventure, and then A Link to the Past, right? And there were some open-ended questions, a lot of characters that mentioned stuff that, you know, you, they weren't in the other three games, and they're like, are they gonna fix it? And Ocarina of Time, it, 
fixed it, flushed it out, made a whole story, made a 3D model of something, tossed it out and went, ah, they'll figure that out later. And then they like hint to it. It's just, it's so remarkable the amount of love and thought that went into this goddamn game. So like Skyward Sword expands the story. They, I mean, Skyward Sword came out after Arkham of Time, a good chunk of the while um, afterwards, and it explains how the creation of the Master Sword came to be. In Twilight Princess, you actually get to see what young Link turns into. And there's a whole theory that I have, I'll sh maybe I'll share it at the end, but the hero's shade in Twilight Princess is the hero from Ocarina of Time. And then you've also got Breath of the Wild, which redesigns the entirety of the Temple of Time and where to get the Master Sword, and, and there's flashbacks to like Link getting the Master Sword for the first time, and it's the same exact Master Sword from Ocarina. Ah! Nintendo! <laughs> My heart can't take this. It's just so good. <laughs> it's like everything in Zelda. I know what they're thinking. Nintendo's just like, let's just dump all our money into this, because clearly, Clearly, we have a good story here. Everyone's gonna play it. Everybody loves it. Why wouldn't you? It's a meta. It's the best story in any Zelda game I've ever played. When you boil it down, um, you're basically, you know, the protagonist Link, traveling back and forth in time, seven years. You get seven years in this game. And you can be a child Link or an adult Link. And you can do, th you have two separate worlds that you can bounce around between to go solve puzzles, find items, get new tools, unlock parts of a dungeon as a kid, and then when you go back as an adult, you're like, whoa, it's open now. And, and that that's a big portion of like the last temple where you have to come back as a kid, you complete part of it as a child, like about half the dungeon as a child. And then you go back to the temple of time, stick the sword in the thing, you zoom zoom to the future, you come back as an adult, and the things you did make you able to beat the rest of the dungeon in the future. And you see things that happened in the past as a kid, and then when you come back, those, those things have kind of finished and come to fruition. I'm not gonna spoil what happens, but um, there was a conflict, and then you get to resolve the conflict as an adult. And it's very satisfying, because you do feel, even though it's impossible, you do feel like you know what it's like to witness something happen as a kid and then Boom, you're an adult and you come back and you're like, I can fix this. It's a lot like therapy. You know, you think back on it and you relive it for a second and your therapist is like, maybe you have trouble letting go. And you're like, that's, God, that's it. <laughs> oh. So I've talked about time travel already. Time travel is, I mean, the whole story basically. It's the ocarina of time. What's cool here is that it sets up a break in the timeline. And this break in the timeline is the linchpin of every other game in the Zelda series. How do I explain this? So there are three branching arcs from Ocarina of Time. The first one is where the hero is successful, adult Link stabs the final boss in the face, he wins, cool, and the world plays out after that. It's one timeline. The second timeline is adult Link gets his cheeks absolutely clapped by Ganon, the world falls into despair and the rise of like this awful dark world comes to be. And in the third timeline, my favorite idea, they basically said, hey, you know how you're seven and then you're set or you're 10 and you're 17. How about we let the world where you're, you're 10, like you just never did anything bad and how the, how Hyrule plays out after that. So you got these three branching timelines and they just started making games in each one. They didn't care. It was great, they were like, okay, we wanna, we wanna bring back bird people. Ha Lionels, you remember those from Zelda 1? Let's bring those back, those would be cool. How about, how about that, awesome. Oh, we don't have Demon King Ganon in this one, we can just make Ganondorf a badass dude with a sword. Cool, it's just incredible what they came up with. And then the story that comes from that event happening in Ocarina of Time, all the stories that come out of it, they're so imaginative, they're not cohesive. I don't want to say they're cohesive because there's some things like, you know, where you look back on it, like in Breath of the Wild, you got all these giant machines running around and you're like, I didn't see any of that in Ocarina of Time. What are you guys talking about? And they're like, oh, it's these old ancient tablets that have always been here. And they're like, I don't know, I played the other games. I don't think they're there. Oh, 
So I've divided the gameplay mechanics of Ocarina of Time into three distinct parts. Puzzles, combat, and platforming. Let's go ahead and talk about combat for the first part of this. Um, easily, easily the best part of Ocarina of Time, hands down. Like, the team at Nintendo basically invented a new thing called Z-targeting, where you would lock on to an enemy and you could circle around them while keeping your vision fixated upon them, right? It is such a cool thing to witness in 1998 where you saw games without any kind of a lock-on in 3D space. They, they attempted it, they sure as hell tried to attempt it, but Ocarina of Time nailed it, dude. I mean, and then after they came up with that mechanic, all you have to do is throw in a sword-wielding, shield-bearing elf with a thousand different items. Different bows that can freeze or ignite enemies. He's got an arsenal of items in this game that make every single session of combat feel like a new experience. Even smaller enemies feel intense. The music rises up, your camera locks onto them like over your shoulder sometimes. Sometimes it pans out and just creates a small field of view around you and the enemy where you both circle each other. Um, some of the enemies that come to mind are like Lizzlefos, Stallfos. Um, Deku Scrubs even give you like this intense feeling of one-on-one -on -one combat and it's very reminiscent of Zelda 2. The puzzle solving is also really really good in this game. Granted, I have to critique it. Shooting an eye on the wall to open a door is not a puzzle. But navigating a maze where some walls are fake, some walls can be blown up, some walls, you, you can just walk right through it, it's just an optical illusion. And you can use items like the Lens of Truth to discern which walls are real and fake. You can use your sword to hit the wall to see if they can be blown up. You can, and you don't even have to use bombs, you can use bomb chews. You can ignite um, torches all across the room with either, you know, fire arrows or Din's fire that creates a gigantic ball of flames that expands out around you. They had a lot of tools to work with, and they absolutely nailed the puzzle solving. Um, a lot of people give crap to the Water Temple, it's not great, it's not super, it's not super enjoyable, let's be real, but they did utilize the physics in their game with floating platforms in water specifically. That was totally unique in the Zelda franchise where you can actually have new tunnels and new places to go and explore simply because you, you played a little doo -doo 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 -doo, and then the water would rise or fall and it would lift platforms up or sink them down, either opening up new pathways or providing a bridge to a new wing of the temple completely. I want to bash the Water Temple, I really do. It's much better in the remakes because you don't have to constantly open your pause menu to equip the iron boots. Great quality of life there, but the temple basically remains the same. Uh, Ocarina of Time did a really, really, really good job of making each dungeon have a different style of puzzle. Last up, we have the platforming. I think it's arguably the weakest part of this game. It's, it's not great. You, you tend to like, let go of edges that you've latched onto, and you, there's no explanation why. They don't, they don't tell you like, oh, you can grab that one, but you can't grab that one. Oh, you're gonna fall off here, and you can't grab it, but you, you can grab this one. That doesn't really make sense. But they did add the hook shot, and the hook shot is such a great item. It originated in The Link to the Past, but in the 3D setting, they literally said, hey, you know that scorpion guy from Mortal Kombat? Get over here! How about you do that to everything? Anything you can latch onto, you can just and then Link takes off into the sky. You're temporarily invincible. Now we get to talk about sound. And you know exactly what I'm gonna say. The sound in Ocarina of Time, Koji Kondo's score, the sound effects that they came up with, even the ones that they used from like the N64 pre-rendered sound library, masterful. It's so good. The melodies are so good in all of the songs. One of my favorite parts about the sound design is the Ocarina of Time itself can be used as a weapon to stun enemies. If you run into certain enemies, you can play the Song of Storms or the Sun Song, and it will temporarily incapacitate them, letting you hack away at their, their frozen bodies. I would not do you justice if I did not say forthright that the music that Koji Kondo wrote for this game is absolutely legendary. People have been rewriting and transcribing these songs for almost two and a half decades now. They are charming, they are short, they are sweet, they instill a sense of home and comfort, and it's, it's very well done. I didn't think they would be able to do something like that in, in any Zelda game, honestly, because uh, the game before Ocarina of Time, Link to the Past, was very dark. And when you got the, the sweet potato ocarina in Link to the Past, it just went and then you would get carried away by a duck, I guess. Eh, awesome. We should have brought the duck back. I'm gonna go ahead and be the first one to say, should have had a magic duck. 
That would have been cool. I, I, I wouldn't want like a big duck. Just like a little one. Adult Link. Like, doo -doo 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 -doo, and, then, and then he picks up Adult Link and he's like, ah! Sound effects are pretty dope. It feels heavy when you hit an enemy. Like the, the damaging noises and stuff. Uh, Link sounds like he's in pain when he gets hit by stuff. It, satisfying, to say the least. Like not mind blowing, but they fit the game very, very well. It has been 24 years that this game has been out. People are still speed running it. People are still streaming it. People are still doing reviews about it. Fourth wall break. The replayability of this game is second to none, almost. And like I've said earlier in the video, it ends up on the greatest game of all time list over and over and over and over again. And for good reason, because it's nearly impossible to complete it 100% on your first playthrough. Actually, if you do a specific set of things in the wrong order, you can't complete it 100%. That Deku Nut glitch is weird. Not only that, there's also side quests that are optional for completing the game. There are characters that you would never meet unless you explore and they say goofy things. You can go back and wear masks from the Happy Mask Shop and it'll trigger new dialogue for the characters that you've already talked to over and over again. It's very flushed out. There's a lot of mini games you can go find, like the Bomb Chew play thing, the, the Bomb Alley or whatever it's called. Bomb Chew Alley, that's what it is. You can go back and try and 100% that, get some upgrades. Um, there's like archery things where you can use your slingshot, use your bow in the future, and then you can get quiver upgrades or uh, nut sack upgrades. Not even making that up. That's what you get. You get a big old nut sack if you do really well with your slingshot. It's just so much fun to be Link in this world, to be a hero, to go out and just help people, help save the world. Granted, it's Link's fault. He caused the whole downfall of this entire planet. But he, you know, you get to go out and beat up monsters in the night. It's just so perfect, man. It's, it's very hard. My favorite game in the world is Jet Force Gemini. I think that game is a masterpiece. But Ocarina of Time, it gives it a run for its money, man. It's very good. I think Jet Force Gemini has like slightly better gameplay, more enthralling of a, you know, a, a pretty enthralling story. I think, you know, Ocarina of Time here might have the better story just because it's more fanciful and Jet Force Gemini is more futuristic. It is a resounding yes across the video game industry that The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time was an obelisk in the gaming industry. And it still stands strong today, nearly a quarter of a century later. Even just like for the combat and puzzle solving elements alone, this game is ridiculously good. If you have not played and beaten Ocarina of Time, go spend some money. Seriously, because it's like a good 40 hours worth of your time. And even with access to the internet, you can, you still get tripped up. You'll find tons of old game fact pages that are all like written out where they drew the master sword with parentheses and dashes and periods and stuff. It's very funny. You know, even if you don't try Majora's Mask, which also recommend you do, go try Ocarina of Time because it's just so perfect, man. It, everything about that game from the aesthetics to the story, to the gameplay, to the combat, to the bosses, to the dungeons, to the puzzle solving, to the item repertoire, to the characters, to the character development. Awesome. Please go try it. Zelda Ocarina of Time, easily a 10 out of 10. called Majora's Mask. It is an accursed item from legend that is said to have been used by an ancient tribe in its hexing rituals. It is said that an evil and wicked power is bestowed upon those who wear that mask. According to legend, the trouble caused by Majora's Mask were so great, the ancient ones fearing such catastrophe sealed the mask in shadow forever, preventing its misuse. Welcome to my stream setup. I know it looks intimidating, but it's like eight years old, so it's not super duper anymore. 
It's all right. Two years after Ocarina of Time, we were blessed with another gift from the Nintendo gods, a sequel, a direct sequel to Ocarina of Time, Majora's Mask. Imagine all the praise, all the admiration, all the love that I just spewed about over Ocarina of Time, right? Carry that over to Majora's Mask, add a couple new mechanics, some new textures that look really good, and you have another masterpiece for the Nintendo 64. There's a whole new continent, a whole new slew of dungeons. It, it just gets out of hand fast with how much more there is to do. And it's a lot like just continuing the game. If you loved Ocarina of Time, I have no doubt in my mind that you will love Majora's Mask. This was, and still is, arguably, the greatest sequel to the greatest game ever made. In fact, there's only one other thing I can think of that might kind of top it in the technological world. Um, I think the best add-on ever created to something was private browsing for the internet. All right, my aunt sent me an AOL email. Let me look at this really quick. Why did you forward me what George W. Bush... All right, so Aunt Millie, I love you so much. Thank you for sending that to me. All right, there's an update to Netscape? What is this? Let me take a quick look at what this says. Private browsing? What does that mean? All right, let me... Uh, so it says I can go onto any single website that I want, and other people who use this computer won't be able to see what I'm doing? At all? I can look at anything that I want. So it's the year 2000, early 2000. You get done with school, you high five your buddies, you get off the bus, you go home, you sit down to watch some Toonami, maybe a little Roroni Kenshin, watch Goku turn Super Saiyan for the first time, and at the commercial break, you see it. The first commercial for Majora's Mask. These were very weird commercials. They were, they were horribly obtuse. They didn't make any sense. You had no idea what was going on until like, partway through the commercial, and then you got to see like a few glimpses of the game. It just, it's very weird. I don't know why Nintendo took the direction, the, the direction that they did with these commercials. It was like one commercial with a couple different lengths that they would just throw in to advertise here and there. You'll, you'll see, I'll show you. Also, in early 2000, you had heard rumors of Project Dolphin, something that Nintendo was working on is gonna be the next gen system. It's kind of common knowledge now, but back in the day, when most of us still had dial-up internet, it wasn't like a well-oiled machine back then. Most websites looked like a Word document. Anyways, alongside the rumors of Project Dolphin, what it was going to be, when it was going to come out, there were also uh, little hints in Nintendo Power about it. Uh, but one thing Nintendo Power did fully like expose and launch was the Nintendo 64 expansion pack. Basically, four megabytes of RAM for your Nintendo 64. And there were two games at launch of this expansion pack that would use it. Donkey Kong 64, Majora's Mask. Needless to say, the kids at the time in the early 2000s, uh, specifically early 2000, uh, we were so pumped. So many rumors started flying around about what Link could transform into. Who's gonna be the bad guy? What's a Majora? We freaked. The internet, also not well regulated, freaked. Everybody panicked because um, we all kind of rolled our eyes at first and said there's no way a sequel is going to be as good as the original. And then we started getting info about the game and we were more than pumped because it looked just like Ocarina. It felt just like Ocarina. The gameplay was very reminiscent of Ocarina. But now you can transform into a Goron, into a Zora. Can you fight with them? Can, do, they, do they do anything different? Are they like necessary? Is there story elements to them? We had no idea. 
And the best we had was the internet, which was like, oh yeah, you can transform into a Gerudo. You could transform into a Keese. You can transform into a Great Fairy. All rumors, all crazy. Oh, it's got shit in my eye. I won't spoil it, but the final mask you get in the game also transforms you into something amazingly badass. So, the story to Majora's Mask, it's just so damn good. The world building is absolutely incredible in this game. The hero from Ocarina of Time basically stumbles upon this mirror image world called Termina, right? And the main problem is there is an imp who found a mask that gives him, like, powers of a deity, right? And he's trying to force the moon to crash into the planet right on top of Termina. This prompts that 10-year-old Time Lord I was talking about to sometimes literally turn the entire planet upside down on its head. Link's adventure in this sister kingdom of Hyrule Termina is, is basically poorly described once more. A Time Lord is preventing the end of the world by wearing masks and participating in the plot of Groundhog Day. The main bad guy is called Majora. But it's not really Majora, it's just his shadow emplaced into a mask that empowers the wearer with evil powers. And that wearer right now seems to be um, the random skull kid you played your ocarina to. What? What the fuck? Then he just starts mugging people, I guess, and eventually he finds this mask that gives him powers. Literally every good aspect of gameplay that I talked about in Ocarina of Time is literally just translated directly into Majora's Mask with a fresh new world with brand new dungeons and bosses, quite a few new enemies, almost all of the old enemies. Now you take that awesome gameplay from Ocarina, right? And then you add in these transformations, and each transformation, there's, there's four, but I'm really gonna talk about the main three you use. There's the Zora, the Goron, and the Deku. They all have different moves. They all have different acrobatics. They can all do different things. The bosses in this game, incredibly well made. There, there's ingenuity and love put into these bosses. My favorite is Twin Mold. Two gigantic centipede worm looking things that jump in and out of a giant ocean of sand. And you get a mask right before it to specifically combat it the giant's mask, and it turns Link as big as they are, evening the odds. All of the boss battles utilize mask transformations to beat the boss, right? This all culminates at the end of the game, where you have the final boss, go figure, Majora, uh, and you have to use each mask's transformation you can in some way to help you fight the final boss. Mainly the Zora, and mainly the final mask that you get, which I'm not gonna try and spoil, but if you don't know what it is by now, then you probably don't give a shit about Legend of Zelda. Uh, another mechanic of the gameplay that we should talk about is the three-day cycle, that Groundhog Day type of thing I was talking about. A lot of people don't like it. In fact, what I've noticed is people who enjoyed Ocarina of Time but didn't enjoy Majora's Mask don't enjoy it because there's a three-day cycle that you have to play around. Let me explain. You have a section of three days. You got day one, day two, day three. All the characters in every part of Termina, at a very specific time of day, do the exact same thing, right? Link can navigate this and solve kind of like intricate social dilemmas. He can reunite lost lovers, whatever. Each day has a very clear, hard reset. And the camera will pan away from Link and it will say, night of the second day, dawn of the third day. Everything gets interrupted to reset these characters into the proper positions. The three-day cycle thing too, when you restart it, takes away all your items, gives you full health and magic back, and you restart back at square one. This is a cool mechanic to duck out of hard situations, or if you're running out of time in a specific thing that you're doing, you can just reset the three days, make your way back to exactly where you were, try it again. You can hit an owl statue placed throughout the game that you can fast travel to, reset the three-day cycle, and then Try the dungeon again. You can do this, like, anywhere. I don't think you can play the Song of Time in boss battles, but that seems to be, like, the only place that you can't just reset everything. Which, again, power of a deity in the hands of a 10-year-old. 
Uh, puzzle solving, I would go on and on about it, but it's almost the exact same level as Ocarina of Time. And Ocarina of Time's puzzle solving was awesome. Majora's Mask does it just as well, if not better in some scenarios, because now instead of just playing as Link, you can play as a Goron, a Zora, a Deku, and use all these different characters to like solve complex problems, which is refreshing, it's cool. It's not such a huge step that it blows your mind. If you liked the puzzle solving in Ocarina of Time, you'll probably like it in Majora's Mask, just full stop. There might be a few new additives to it, but it's about the same type of vibe, you know? Each of the masks that are just normal, like Link goes ha and puts it on, do weird things, like the bomb mask that can just blow stuff up. Uh, my favorite is the stone mask, which makes you unnoticeable unless you talk to people directly. You can just walk right by them. Nobody even notices you're there. Enemies that would normally notice you ignore you completely. Imagine having a mask that you could just boop and then like disappear from life. No one pays attention to you anymore. I want a divorce. Next Thursday. Next Thursday, you're gonna call the office, you're gonna get a goddamn divorce. There's so many goddamn dishes. He's lucky I love him. He's lucky I love him and that I share a house with him. I can't believe that he left this many dishes for me to clean. I am not his mother. I'm not. I'm not his mother. This is an absolute monstrous amount of bullshit. This is unacceptable. I am mad. I am very mad. I've never seen anyone make this many dishes so quickly. This is some bullshit. He's just like his dad. He's just like his father. I can't trust him to do anything. How does Sharon even deal with this? Was she picking up after him his whole life? Karen, you're gonna get through this. I will find you. He's gotta be somewhere. I swear to God. Whatever god you believe in, if I find you playing that goddamn game... I'll find him. I can't say anything about the sound that wasn't already said for Ocarina of Time. They pretty much reused almost all the sound effects with a few new sound effects added in for bosses, maybe a few new enemy sound effects. I will say the score for Majora's Mask, every bit as good as the score for Ocarina of Time. Ocarina has more of like melodies that are, you know, played out and flushed out. And when Sheik plays with you, they're, they're nice. There's a full orchestration behind them. In Majora's Mask, you have like, a monkey squeaking at you, and you play with the monkey. I like that's about it. And they did include some of the songs from Ocarina of Time, like Epona's song, The Song of Time. They did pull those out and put them back into Majora's Mask for very specific reasons. Um, I do think that Ocarina of Time kind of edges out Majora's Mask a little bit on the scoring front, but there are some really, really good tracks on Majora's Mask. Like the final boss theme for Majora, absolutely fantastic. Honestly, a little bit better than the Ganondorf theme from Ocarina of Time. Not, I'm not gonna say like I prefer which one. I could have a sassier day and feel like I'm gonna go Ganondorf. I could have a more solemn day and feel like I'm gonna go Majora. They're very, very close. The overworld theme of Termina, you get this vibe of like being unsettled. It's not really a tonal center. It feels very atonal and mixed up and confused and then you start to hear parts of Hyrule's theme come out and like you kind of hear it sometimes. It's very cool. Not quite as good, but still cool. Basically, Koji Kondo 
took gold from Ocarina of Time and just polished it and added like a little small gold nugget next to it. And he was like, done, Majora's Mask. Awesome, perfect. The replayability of Majora's Mask is also the same level of intensity as Ocarina of Time, if not more, because there's more things to collect. They didn't nearly have as many bosses in Majora's Mask, so you didn't just get heart containers and get more health. You got like five, and then the rest were heart pieces, just everywhere. Eh, like, you gotta go find that. And in addition to the regular collectibles, like bow, quiver upgrades, um, bomb upgrades, Deku nut upgrades, Deku stick upgrades, you also have to find masks. There's like 24 of them, because I did beat this game 100%. I bought that Nintendo Power Guide. There are so many items and collectibles in this game that the 100% world record, I think was only set a couple months ago, and it's September 2022 right now. One thing I will say about Majora's Mask is its affinity for the macabre. It's a dark game. You watch these lovely, kind characters that you get to know over the course of this three-day cycle become helpless and hopeless at an impending death. I really think that this is The Legend of Zelda's most emotionally dark game that they've ever made. It's a lot like a Shakespearean tragedy. You see this love and this kindness bursting forth throughout the story, and at the end, you kind of have this acceptance of pain and suffering alongside of these deep connections that you've made. The flow of time is always cruel. It seems different for each person, but no one can change it. A thing that doesn't change with time is a memory of younger days. It's a bittersweet ending. Honestly, the tale of the hero of time in these two Nintendo 64 games, it's a tragedy. The reason I think that Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask are such an emotional roller coaster, it is just up and down and up and down over and over and over again, is because it's a very good allegory for life. That sometimes you make everlasting bonds, and sometimes it feels like the world is burning to the ground. In Ocarina of Time, as a child, things are much more lighthearted. People are generally more happy. But as an adult in Ocarina of Time, it's dark and dreary. It, it, you accept this mantle of responsibility to save people. And in Majora's Mask, you see an acceptance of pain and suffering. It's a cool, like, you know, uh, euphemism for Buddhism, that sometimes pain is life and suffering, and the only way through it is the middle path. The other part of Majora's Mask that I like is the veneer of innocence. At the beginning of your three-day cycle, people are much happier, much more alive. Um, some people are more cynical, the good times will come to an end. But towards the end of the three-day cycle, you see desperation, you see cruelty, you see anger, denial, acceptance. And it's just a really good lesson to teach kids. Like, you don't want to go overboard with it, but this set of video games does a really good job of teaching children that bad things will happen, and sometimes there are heroes, and sometimes there are not. I hope you try these games. I hope you go out and at least think about getting a Switch and trying them on the virtual console that they have, or going out and buying a Nintendo 64 console just to experience what it was like to have these two games. And thank you, Nintendo. You understood what we wanted at the time. These, these are masterpieces. These are games that will be played forever. Every single gamer that I know who at least enjoys Nintendo raves about The Legend of Zelda. I can't think of a single person who's just like, yeah, Legend of Zelda, yeah, it kind of sucks. Suck. Those are like, those are insane crazy people. In the gaming community, The Legend of Zelda series is known as a classic work of art and Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask are the pinnacle of that art. 
It has such a depth in its simplicity. It has such an elegance in its kind presentation of the facts of life. I, and yes, I'm getting esoteric at this point because I just want to gush about these games endlessly. Thank you. You changed my childhood, and you changed the childhood of countless children by making these games. So thank you. Do I do a sign off? A lot of YouTubers at this point would say, hey, like and subscribe, it helps with the algorithm. I don't care if you do. I really don't. I do this because I enjoy doing this, and hopefully you enjoy this stuff as well. If you like these games and you want to see someone absolutely confirm your bias about it, I'm your guy. I will tell you, however, that I stream like five nights a week if you want to come see me play these old games. I'm doing Banjo-Kazooie this week. I think it's the first week of September here. I think the first week actually just ended. I'm in the second week. We've been doing Banjo-Kazooie. I'm getting ready tonight to go play Jackbox games with my girlfriend. And we have, you know, the community come in and say the funniest things they can think of. And Saturday nights, whoa. Oh, we have Super Smash Schmatter Days. It's so much fun, man. It's so fun to watch the people, to see the smack talk over Super Smash Bros, especially in my Discord, which I've got a Discord, by the way. But the smack talk in the Discord is so good. There's times where they're like, hey, Jake, I hope you shower because I want those cheeks nice and clean before I spank them. <laughs> It's so good, because then, you know, like, the people who do the biggest smack talk, like, I'm one of them, I suck, I lose every game, like, I, <laughs> just like, are you ready? I'm gonna take your mother out for a nice seafood dinner before you get screwed in this game, and, well, you know, it's just ridiculous, but I have so much fun with it. You should come along, it's great. Thank you for being here, thank you for watching, you're awesome. I'm gonna work on some other stuff here in the next few weeks, and hopefully I'll have another video out by the end of September, because I really, really need to keep on this. I did start a new job, so I've been kind of, you know, in the interim of that, I apologize. I suck. I should be better at time management. I'm gonna try to be better. So, you guys have a wonderful day, uh, and I'll see you next time. Bye.